Please join me in welcoming one of the most fearless defenders of the Second Amendment from the Lone Star State, Senator Ted Cruz. Oh, God, no. And we will ban men. Oh, no. We'll just listen to a little. I know it's, it's, this is, the, I would get the kids out of the room. Yeah, this is, it's very gross. I want to speak today on the nature of evil. Oh. We're gathered today under crushing darkness. On Tuesday, less than 300 miles away, an evil man murdered 19 children and two teachers. Within hours, I was on a plane back to Texas from Washington. Blaming doors instead of guns. Next day in Uvalde. There I sat down with law enforcement, with local officials. And I joined in a community prayer vigil that evening. Prayer, okay. As the entire community was reeling from the shooting. We prayed together and we cried together. Mourn why does no one ever ask, why didn't we use prayer to prevent the shooting? Why are we only using prayer after the fact? Words to describe a monster who enters a school and murders little children. 19 little kids. 19 families in Uvalde who lost their little boys and their little girls. Two families of teachers who aren't here with us anymore. None of us will ever truly understand the manifest evil that devastated Uvalde on that day. We do understand the evil of the NRA, however. The entire country. Oh, yeah, let's go over here. Oh, they're not even carrying it. Sorry, guys. And grieving. And it is an evil that has happened too many damn times. Light applause for that. In the last several years, especially, Texas has repeatedly seen the face of evil. Yeah. Repeatedly. Makes you think. I've been on the ground after these tragedies. On the ground in Cancun. One after another. I was in Dallas in 2016, in Sutherland Springs in 2017, in Santa Fe in 2018, in El Paso and Midland, Odessa in 2019. And now Uvalde. And I still won't change anything. Was the picture of horror. If children are the picture of innocence, then the lunatics and the monsters like this one the one who would deliberately murder children. They are the picture of evil. Many of us in this room are mothers and fathers. Now, are they evil or mentally ill? Because mental illness isn't evil, it's an illness. So is he now going with evil or are they still going with mentally ill? Of those families right now is unimaginable. The very worst pain on earth. It's All both. of us in Texas need to come together and comfort those families right now. We need to love them, embrace them, and take care of them. Very light applause. The most applause was when Christy Noem said the Second Amendment is the most important thing. For all of this stuff about the victims, there's very, very sparse applause. There's another consistent pattern that I've seen. Repeatedly. Despite the darkness, I've seen love and compassion yeah. and heroin. There's this crazy pattern. The more guns per capita a country has, the more shootings per capita a country has. It's perplexing, but it's evil. There's and lay people coming together and standing as one. No matter the horror, our state's response to each act of evil, to each challenge, 
has been zero. Has always been one of unity and strength and resilience. Uvalde is strong. Texas is strong. And the entire country stands alongside the men and women who are grieving in Uvalde today. We will get through this. And we will come through this together. At the same time, it is incumbent on us to understand what is behind these evil attacks. Well, you know, when we were growing up, this kind of thing didn't happen. Kids may have worried about getting into a fist fight at school, maybe a bloody nose at recess, but we never worried about a psychopath coming into our classrooms to commit murder. What? The the elites who dominate our culture. Anybody know what that person yelled out? Firearms lie at the root of the problem. By elites, I refer to some of the most powerful politicians and their allies in the media, the leaders of the largest corporations and many of the most famous celebrities, and those who echo and amplify them. Their resources are limitless. Their megaphone is enormous. And their voice can be deafening. It sounds like it's not a gun issue, according to Ted. ...from behind great bulwarks of safety, from gated communities equipped with private security, or at the very least, from safe and expensive neighborhoods protected by high home prices. Like where Ted lives. Such people can afford an indulgent ideology that ignores reality. As is so often the case, those furthest from the halls of power are the most dependent on the ability to defend themselves. For millions of Americans, the right to keep and bear arms is not theoretical, it's not abstract. For a single mom in a dangerous neighborhood, it is a matter of basic security. Taking guns away from these responsible Americans will not make them safer, nor will it make our nation more secure. Hard to believe. In an age where elites embrace defunding the police, when homelessness runs rampant, when gangs dominate entire communities, and when radical district attorneys refuse to prosecute violent crime in cities across America, rarely, has the Second Amendment been more necessary to secure no. the... Reducing the number of guns won't reduce the number of shootings, says a guy from the country with the most guns and the most shootings. But many would still tell us that the evil on display in Uvalde or in Buffalo derives from the presence of guns. Yeah, it's also funny because if you look at the 10 point list I proposed, not a single one of the things I proposed would take away that gun from the imaginary mom he's talking about. But four of the things would have limited this particular shooter's ability to have the particular guns that he had. So there are plenty of solutions that I mean, listen, the 10 I proposed would not prevent that mom from having the gun. She might have had to wait a few days, the waiting period. She would have had to have a background check. She would have to get insurance. But she would still be able to have her gun. Requires a sick soul to drive a truck into a crowded sidewalk, to plan a bomb at a marathon, or to fly a plane into a building. It requires a sick soul to open fire in a movie theater or in a church. Right. They're still pretending that at the Aurora movie theater shooting, dark room, guns start going off. Okay. They're still pretending that having more people in there in the dark with guns would have helped anything. It's it's one of the most delusional examples of this. Forcing us to ask hard questions, demanding that we see where our culture. Is failing. Well, we know where it's failing. Looking at broken families. Absent fathers, declining church attendance, social media bullying. Church attendance is the reason for the shootings. Hmm. In video games, chronic isolation.
prescription drug and opioid abuse and their collective wow. effects on the psyche of young Americans. This is quite frankly a, a fascist diatribe. This this is crazy. Faceted. It's a lot easier to moralize about guns and to shriek about those you disagree with politically. But it's never been about guns. We know that places with some of the most restrictive gun laws, places like Chicago and Baltimore and Washington, D.C., they don't have less gun violence. Indeed, they contain some of the most dangerous communities on the face of the earth. We also know that there are communities in places like Texas with extraordinarily high rates of gun ownership and extraordinarily low rates of gun violence. We know that keeping guns away from citizens who follow the law does very little to keep them away from criminals who ignore the law. We know that there are no more guns per capita in this nation today than there were 50 or 100 years ago. That's worth underscoring. In 1972, the rate of per capita gun ownership in the United States was 43%. In 2021, the rate is 42%. The rate of gun ownership hasn't changed. And yet, acts of evil like- Understand that that's deceptive. So the, the guns per capita and the rate of gun ownership are two different things. People tell us. These horrific crimes occur only in America. That simply isn't true. Oh. The data show, according to the Crime Prevention Research Center, quote, out of the 101 countries where we have identified mass public shootings occurring, the United States ranks 66th in the per capita frequency of these attacks and 56th in the murder rate. But to be clear, one is one too many. We know that many of these who seek to commit the most heinous crimes, they're isolated from human contact. They're living a virtual life in the absence of community and faith and love. None of that excuses their heinous acts. None of that reduces oh, the evil of their deeds. That's not clear. But these are questions we have to answer if we want to rescue our country. I ask these cultural questions because mere technocratic solutions, the acts of legislators or of government regulators will not alone solve what ails us. And those who proclaim that it will are not telling you the truth. They are demagoguing for political gain. Now, some may be naive enough to confuse their virtue signaling with real solutions. But most are engaged in the most cynical kind of politics. They say, as Ima President Obama did this. Imagine speaking at the NRA and saying other people are engaged in cynical politics. Do something, they demand. And here, perhaps to the surprise of some, I emphatically agree. There have been too damn many of these killings, and we must act decisively to stop them. Okay. And what would you do? But what is the something right. we should do? To Washington Democrats, the answer is so-called universal background. We know, we know it's not guns, but give us the answers. Is he going to mention doors here? Maybe windows, sinks and showers? All firearms. Here's the problem. Their so-called solutions wouldn't have stopped these mass murders. And sure. they know this. I mean, four of the things I proposed would have had an impact. The Uvalde shooter, and I won't use his name, and nor should anyone else, he should fade into eternal anonymity. Wow, what a courageous. What courage. But that son of a bitch passed a background check. As for so-called assault rifles, 
which the left and the media love to demonize. These guns were banned for 10 years from 1994 to 2004. And the Department of Justice examined the effect of the ban and concluded that it had zero to statistically significant effect. It had zero to testicular effect. Yeah, um, that's not my understanding of the data, by the way, but I don't have it in front of me. They know it won't work. That won't stop these horrific crimes. The answer for too many of them is that their real goal. Now, again, if you look at my list of proposals, if you can't have high capacity firearms under age 25, the shooter would have maybe gotten a handgun. You don't kill as many people with the handgun. If you're under 25, you need two or three letters from community adults saying they think it's a fine idea for you to have firearms based on what we know about this guy. He might not have been able to get those letters. If you had been required to have gun insurance, it's possible that that would have made it inconvenient or priced him out. So so the idea that nothing will do anything. No, 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 no. There's lots of things that could be done. And the reason is simple. The law abiding citizens follow the law, but the criminals do not. That is why they're criminals. But let me tell you what would happen. If they succeeded in confiscating guns, confiscating many more people understand it, offering a buyback is a different thing. Statistic from the Obama White House, hardly Obama. a right wing source. Guns are used defensively to stop a crime between 500,000 and 1 million times every single year. Uh, Harvard has studied this. Guns are not used 500,000 to a million times each year in self-defense. There are uh, a, it's actually extraordinarily rare. Um, you can look this up. Harvard Injury Control Research Center. Um, most purported self-defense gun uses are actually gun uses in escalating arguments. They aren't something that we should uh, cheer. And firearms are used far more often to intimidate than in self-defense and later reported as I just use my gun defensively. That's not what is happening. Let's focus on what works. Stopping the bad guys, imprisoning violent criminals and protecting our vulnerable. Understand a ton of these defensive gun uses are you have an argument in your in your yard, just an argument with an unarmed person. You pull your gun out, the person flees, and that gets reported as a defensive gun use. Give me a break, guys. Give me a break. Grassley Cruz did three things. First, it would mandate that the Department of Justice conduct an audit of federal agencies oh. to make sure that all felony convictions have been reported to the database. Second, Grassley Cruz would create a gun crime task force at the Department of Justice specifically to prosecute felons or fugitives who try to buy firearms illegally. In 2010, there were so four of my ideas would have affected the Uvalde shooter. So far, none of Ted's would have affected the Uvalde shooter. Justice prosecuted. Only 44 of them. That is indefensible. Third, Grassley Cruz would have authorized $300 million for school safety improvement grants to harden our schools. Oh, God. When Grassley Cruz came to the Senate floor for a vote in 2013, 52 senators voted yes, including nine Democrats. Yeah, there's a good point, which is like the hardened felons. Oh, by the way, this this loser here. Yeah, of course, David, you know how to fix everything. Well, no, but hold on a second. See that. I'm getting the sense that that's not a good faith comment. Look at my video. Look at my 10 proposals and critique each of them individually. That's the way we evaluate these things.
could have stopped at least some. Of no, I won't ban that guy. He can for now. He can hang out. Grassley Cruz is a perfect example. Take Sutherland Springs. There, it was already illegal for the shooter to purchase firearms. Doubly so, because he was a felon and because he had a domestic violence conviction. So how did he get his guns? Because the Obama Air Force oh, failed to report his felony conviction to the database. And so he passed the background check. That is almost never the issue. I'm with him on this. You've got to report it, you, you, but it's almost never the issue. His felony conviction and the gun crimes task force would have prosecuted him for the felony of lying on the background check form. Yeah, maybe. I mean, it's actually pretty rare that people even get prosecuted for that. That's the other part of this federal prison. Instead of murdering 26 innocent people in that beautiful sanctuary. To this day, I don't know if any reporter has asked even a single Democrat why they filibustered bipartisan gun violence legislation that could have made a real difference saving lives. So what about Uvalde? Well, part of Grassley Cruz was $300 million to upgrade school security because we've seen a tragic pattern repeat. When I sat down with the families at Santa Fe, we discussed how that monster had entered through an unlocked back door, how he'd been able to make it to a classroom unimpeded and murder innocent children. We also know that there are best practices at federal buildings and courthouses where for security reasons, they limit the means of entry to one entrance. I still don't get how this is a solution because then everybody gets funneled in through the same place. Can't the shooter just wait right where that one spot is? I mean, I just maybe I'm too stupid to understand this brilliant idea. Higher exits should only open out. At that single point of entry, we should have multiple armed police officers. Okay. I mean, listen, I would get rid of the windows. Anybody could shoot through a window, too. Veterans trained to provide security and keep our children safe. <laughs> Maddeningly, the shooter in Uvalde got in the exact same way. The Santa Fe shooter did. He walked through an unlocked back door into an open classroom. We need serious funding to upgrade our schools, to install bulletproof doors and locking classroom doors. These schools are sounding more and more like prisons. What about a moat? And to hire law enforcement to protect our most precious asset. Our There's some degree to which this feels kind of like the, hey, you know, what was the rape victim wearing? Were they properly protected from the rape versus like, oh, if we just reduce the number of people trying to rape, we might be better off. My legislation to allow schools to access one point three billion dollars in federal funds to improve school safety. Had Uvalde gotten a grant to upgrade the school security, they might have made changes that could have stopped this shooter and killed him at the single point of entrance with armed law enforcement there on the ground before he hurt any of these innocent kids and teachers. It does feel like the NRA must be struggling as a result of this, right? I mean, there, there. I know that tons of people still love it, but I would be very curious what the effect is of this entire fiasco on their membership. Guys, like Stephen Williford, the heroic plumber and NRA rifle instructor who grabbed his AR-15 and ran barefoot to stop the murderer at Sutherland Springs.
or the Border Patrol tactical unit who finally killed the Uvalde monster. And that's why the media's cynicism and dishonesty on this topic is so pernicious. The media blames you, the millions of members of the NRA, for these crimes. That didn't the Sutherland shooting end because the shooter just crashed his car? Like I, I, mean, I, I don't even know about these examples. Like you have to research every single thing this guy says. Has committed these kinds of unspeakable crimes. Everybody here is horrified, utterly horrified, by these mass murders. But more importantly, but it is the law-abiding patriots here, like Stephen Williford, who over and over and over again step up and risk their lives to stop these depraved lunatics. The media wanted all of us to stay away. But you are not the cause of this evil. Instead, you are fighting to defend the Bill of Rights, to keep people safer in their homes and on the subway, to protect our families. You are the veterans, the law enforcement members, the courageous men and women who rise to defend your fellow neighbors. We must not react to evil and tragedy by abandoning the Constitution or infringing on the rights. We're not citizens. Now is not the time to yield to panic or intimidation or fear. Now is not the time for lies. It is not the time for empty political gestures. Now is the time for unity. Now is the time for love. And now is the time for action to protect our rights, to stop those with evil in their hearts, and to do everything humanly possible to protect our children and to protect our families. God bless you. Well, one of the most dangerous speeches I have ever seen since I have been covering politics. Uh, I uh, tweeted as much just moments ago. Absolutely absurd. Although I have a feeling maybe the next speech from Donald Trump could be even worse.